All right, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Can you guys hear me okay? Assalamu alaikum. So, uh, my presentation has uh, you know, a bit of philosophy, a bit of uh, medicine, and a bit of religion. And uh, let's start with the uh, philosophy of knowledge. So, knowledge or ilm, as it's called in Arabic, is a metaphysical reality which inherently exists with every existent being, or what we call wujud. So, when something comes into existence, the knowledge with it inherently comes into existence as well. Knowledge has also been described as light or a nur, which by its very essence being, brings hidden realities to light. And there are obvious advantages of you know, uh, obtaining knowledge, and this is human nature to seek knowledge. In words of Imam Sadiq that uh, knowledge is the basis of every, every sublime state and culmination of every high station. Now, knowledge of one being can be acquired by another being. You know, and this sort of follows a hierarchical or order so the highest being in existence should have the ability to acquire knowledge of every other being. And that is exactly what the Quran says about God or Allah that huwa lawwal wa al-akhir wa al-zahir wa al-batun wa huwa bi kulli shayin alim. And he has full knowledge of all things. Now how do you acquire this knowledge? Well, I can broadly divide into two categories. You know, that's you know, based on the philosophy of it. That one is what we are all familiar with, which is called acquired knowledge. Uh, and a simple example of it would be observation. You know, so you learn about things through using your senses. Even a baby learns to, you know, recognize her his mother or you know. Uh, so it's basic sensory observation is uh, is is used to acquire knowledge. And then the second is through communication. It could be both verbal or written. It's like somebody tells me that there is a conference going on in Chicago about you know initiative on Islam and medicine. That's verbal communication. The exact dates I can log on to the website and see. So that's written communication through which I can acquire knowledge about this conference. The other knowledge that we use more in scientific principles is the empirical knowledge in which we do experiments to acquire new information. Let's say we had a question that do elephants have kidneys? So how do we acquire that knowledge scientifically? Well, what you can do is take a sample of let's say 100 elephants and then dissect them and see if they have kidneys or not. And then you can you know, up generalize to all the other animals or all the other elephants and say, yes, all elephants have kidneys. But let's say if the ethics doesn't allow you to do that and you want to use, use logic and reason, so you can start with the premise that all elephants are mammals and all mammals have kidneys, so all elephants should also have kidneys. So these are the various ways of acquiring uh, knowledge to what's method called acquired knowledge. And this is where most human beings operate on. This is our realm of operation. But there is another form of knowledge as well, which is called knowledge by presence or direct knowledge. Uh, also uh, in Arabic called ilmul ladunni. So a reference of it is mentioned in Quran in Surah Kahf, where there's a story where Prophet Moses goes and meets a, another person, which is quoted as Prophet Khizr, to acquire knowledge. And this is how uh, Quran describes their interaction. So they found a servant from among our, our servants and we had given him uh, uh, mercy from us, min indana, and we had taught him knowledge from us. This is God mentioning about that. So you guys can you know, look up that. I'm sure most of you are familiar with that. So that's another form of knowledge, knowledge by a presence which sort of comes from within or directly from God. Now there's a method behind that as well. It's just not you know, a pure gift. It requires strict spiritual discipline and obedience to Allah, and there is you know, a method how you can proceed in that path. What would be the examples of those, that kind of knowledge? Well, uh, sometimes we have a new idea or epiphany which just comes from out of nowhere, or a true dream. Let's say you're a famous person that you have never met in person, but you actually meet them in your dream and have a conversation of it. You know. It's also called knowledge by witnessing or mukashfa when you something is shown to you when you don't find that in written in a book or, or, you know, or, or learn from an ordinary way, but something which like a vision of future or something, you can say that. Uh, there's actually an institute in California called Institute of Noetic Sciences, which deals with that knowledge and this kind of knowledge and researches on that. The highest form of this kind of knowledge is called wahi or the revelation. An example of wahi is Quran that we, that we use. So, so what I've said so far is that you know, knowledge is a metaphysical reality, and there are various ways of acquiring it. The highest form of this knowledge is called the wahi, or it's an example of direct knowledge. Now, in 
medicine or physiological, physical or biological sciences, most of this, uh, sci these sciences are based on empirical knowledge, you know, or we maybe employ reason and logic to acquire an understanding of natural phenomena. But there's very little input from direct knowledge or witness knowledge or maybe even say wahi. So what I'll do in this presentation is I'll just pose three questions. These are scientific questions and see what the science has to say and then, then what does wahi or revelation has to say about this. So the first question is, you know, what is the anatomy of human existence? Well, we are on the campus of University of Chicago Medical School and the answer is very straightforward for most people that, you know, we are made up of, I mean, human body is made up of trillions of cells and we have tissues and organs. And how did humans get here? Well, that's also pretty figured out well that humans are primates that evolved from earlier forms and, you know, that's how humans exist in, on this world, planet. So we are primates and then based on out of African origin of modern human theory, you know, humans, human beings evolved on this planet about 60,000 to 200,000 years ago. There are genetic data and fossil evidence to support that. And human beings are composed of trillions of cells which form organs and systems, you know, which work in cohesion to create life. And more importantly, human psychology and human behavior is also an extension of animal behavior and psychology. So if we behave in a certain way, that's also because we are of our origins. And you, know, you can look it out into further what elements we are made up of and you know, go to all the way to the molecular level and subatomic level. Well, what does Quran says about creation of mankind or existence? Well, um, if I uh, quote from Quran, When God uh, called out to, uh, to, uh, to angels and, and told them that I'm about to create man from sounding clay or altered mud, you know. When I have fashioned it and and have inspired my spirit into it, then all of you should prostrate. So one element of existence is clay and the second it mentions uh, is is ruh. Another place, God says, "Wa huwa lazi an shaakum." Who he is the one who brought you min nafsim wahida from a single soul. So that's another thing, which is soul, which uh, exists in our being. And in a series of ayat from Surah Sajda, um, God says, "Al lazi ahsan kull shayin halakahu wa bada halk al insana min tin." So God is the best of creator who initiated the the mankind from clay. Summa jala al naslahu min salatim min ma'im mahin, and then he established its progeny in a uh, in a fluid, which I guess mentions uh, it is referring to sperm. Summa sabwahu wa nafaha fi him in ruhi fa jala lakum al sama wa lafsara wa lafayda ta kalila ma tashkurun, and then but he fashioned them in due proportion and bred them into uh, a spirit. So if you look at what Quran's perspective is that humankind or mankind is a multi-dimensional being. It's not just um, elements in uh, molecules. We have a structure of body or team. Then we also, there's a mention of spirit and ruh and then there's another product which comes out which is called nafs or soul which in, uh, in uh, actually in the philosophy of Mullah Sadra is ex extension of human uh, body. You know. So it's something which starts as material and then becomes immaterial. Well there are more presentations about it in the next sessions and in the afternoon sessions so I won't go into these. But what when we take this as evidence, the revelation as evidence, and then look at and this gives this perspective of human existence, well, it has implications for for practice of medicine. You know, now you're no longer dealing with a physical body only; you are dealing with a you know multi-dimensional being. And how does that affect into pathophysiology and treatment? It is, is is for physicians to research. The other thing is, if we accept human being as a multi-dimensional being, it poses a serious challenge to uh, the theory of natural uh, selection or, or evolution because how do you explain presence of soul uh, just by evolution? So the second question is why do we fall asleep? Well, listening to a boring lecture I guess is, is uh, one of the <laughs> ways of falling asleep. So about we spend about a third of our lifetime sleeping, you know, um, and what we think of, so about, let's say eight hours a day, so that's about a third of our lifetime. What we think of sleep is observed not only in us, but in other mammals, even lower animals. And what the actual function is not known. We don't know why do we fall asleep. But if we don't sleep, we, we realize the implications of it, you know. So sleep is necessary for our optimal physical and mental functioning. Now, scientifically speaking, sleep is divided into what's called REM cycle or rapid eye movement and NREM cycle or the non-rapid eye movement. 
And these are 90 minute cycles distributed throughout the night. So if some, this is somebody's uh, sleep pattern, you'll see they'll have periods of REM sleep and non-REM sleep inter interspersed between each of them. So REM sleep is the active period of the sleep in which there's intense break activity. So brain is not quiet. Brain is quite active during that sleep. Uh, there are brain waves that are detected. The heart rate is fast. We have rapid eye movement, um, you know, heart rate and blood pressure increase. And this is the sleep where most of the dreams occur. There's also a more of deep portion of the sleep which is called non-REM sleep uh, in which there is reduction in physical activity uh, and then person's brain activities also slow down and the blood pressure drops. Now, what keeps us awake? Well, there is a reticulated activating system in brainstem which projects uh, neurons into other parts of the brain which keeps us awake and these, these neuronal activity is what is detected in EEG or the electrical activity of the brain. And, but if we shut that down, that enough is not you know, enough to induce sleep. Sleep is actually actively induced by hypothalamic region as well. So there's both active and passive components. So besides an, uh, a center in the brainstem which is keeping us sleep, there's another center which is trying to uh, induce sleep. And um, uh, one such center is the, is the suprachiasmatic nucleus, uh, SCN right here, uh, in the hypothalamus which uh, gives signals for sleep. So when we are uh, woken up in the morning, our homeostatic sleep drive is the lowest. You know. And as the day progresses, the, this, the, you, know, you get tired, and towards the end of the day, your, your drive for sleep is the highest. The thing is because adenosine build up. At the same time, we also have a circadian wakeful, uh, wakefulness promoting signal, which keeps us awake. So even if you didn't have a good night's sleep uh, last night, you'll be quite awake at 11 or 12, you know, um, 11 a.m. or 12 p.m. because you know there's another signal that is trying to keep you awake. And this is sort of managed uh, like this that your your drive for alertness uh, goes high initially, and then it starts to drop towards the evening or nighttime. In the same way, uh, your homeostatic sleep drive, which is lowest in the beginning and towards the end, is the highest. So you cannot resist sleep. You have to fall asleep eventually. Uh, so, and then melatonin is another component which is uh, thought to, which is, which is re released in response to darkness, and it helps induce that phenomena of sleep. So. There's a lot of research going on, but clearly we don't know why we fall asleep. We just do, and there's no escaping from it. We have to sleep. So let's see what does Quran says about sleep. So this is in Surah Zamar. Allahu yatwaffal anfasa hayna mawtiha. Allah is the one who collects souls. Anfasa hayna, when somebody dies. Wallati lam tamat fi manameha. And also of those who haven't died but during their sleep. So what Quran is saying that we are collecting your souls at the time of death and also at the time of sleep. And those on whom he has passed the decree of death, he keeps the souls back. So we have, must have heard of people going to sleep and never waking up. In, but, but the rest he sends them for an appointed time. Inna fi and then this, in this are signs for people to reflect. Uh, so it has implications for sleep research. I just have two minutes, so I have to quit it quickly. So is there consciousness beyond that? This is the last question. Well, how do you study that scientifically? Well, a good example is cardiac arrest. When people you know, have a cardiac arrest, they don't have physical signs of life. And a lot of people experience what's called near-death experience. In which is experienced by about 10 to 18 percent of cardiac arrest survivors in which they are aware that they are dead. And you know, they, some people experience they're going through a tunnel and they perceive light and they can even meet their dead relatives. There are scales for it. And uh, it's cross-cultural, it's even seen in children. There are really, there's no really good explanation. Some people say it's because of brain releasing certain hormones which causes this near-death experience. And uh, out of brain theory say no, it's really our soul which is experiencing it. I just want to uh, point to one good study which was published in Lancet 2001 in which they took 344 patients who had uh, survived a cardiac arrest and asked them questions about near death experience. About 18% of them said yes. It was seen more so in younger people and women. And, um, and then, you know, so the, the phenomena that people describe were as aware of being dead or they had some positive emotions, seeing light. Uh, some of this presentation is in the, in, the, in the handout as well, so you can go through some of these slides. So this is how we can uh, sort of study near the experience scientifically by doing um, by studying patients who had uh, cardiac arrest now why why somebody experiences we really don't know you know there is really no good scientific explanation for this 
well, question is how does religion, um, you know, answer this question? And uh, I would say that about a third of Quran is dedicated to life after death. So in Quranic understanding, your consciousness does not decrease after that. In fact, it's much more enhanced. And you were oblivious of this. And we have removed the veils from you, and now your vision is quite sharp. And Imam Ali says that people are actually sleeping, and they'll wake up after their death. So my concluding remarks are that revelation represents the highest form of knowledge that is available to mankind. And in order to understand natural phenomena, besides using empirical sciences and logic and reason, we should also refer to these sources like Quran and Hadith, and maybe we can um, have a better understanding of natural world. Thank you.